Hi there, I'm Victoria Schwab. I also write as V.E. Schwab and I have a metaphor problem. If you've ever heard me speak online or in person, you probably already know this about me. I, I love a good metaphor. I drop several with increasing frequency, like the six burner stove. The idea that my brain is a six burner stove with one project on high heat and the other five on low heat. I've also been known to use the glass orb metaphor. The idea that a story idea is like a shining glass orb and the act of writing it down like chucking that orb against a wall and watching it shatter into a hundred pieces. But perhaps my favorite metaphor is the idea of a story corpse looking at your book as if it were a body. And one of the reasons that I do this is because when I started out, because my background was in poetry, I cared about making every single sentence beautiful. The problem was I was concerned with the exact wording, the perfect adjective of a sentence in a scene that would invariably get cut because it wasn't the right scene for the story. So I learned the hard way not to put makeup on an ill-formed corpse. And because of that, because I'm a very anxious person and I don't want to like wander 50,000 words in the wrong direction or lose an incredible amount of work, I began to subscribe to the idea of a story corpse. I think part of the reason that the story corpse is so appealing to me is because rewriting is a huge part of writing, perhaps the most important part of writing. And so you kind of, the story corpse encourages you to build the foundation, to build outward from the bones to the muscle and tissue to the skin, and then to the makeup or the clothes or the style or whatever that is, so that you make sure that you give space to the revision process and you don't become so tethered to the words that you're writing that you are loath to lose the scene because of the words, not because of the story, which absolutely happens. The Near Witch, my very first published novel, I had to rewrite from scratch. Basically, I think maybe a paragraph survived. And I had put so much energy into the exact wording of those scenes that even though I, I learned that those weren't the right scenes, I, was, I had a really hard time letting go of the scenes because they were so beautifully, precisely written. So some of this, some of the story corpse idea is self-preservation, right? And some of it is just, making sure that our story passes the stress tests along the way. So first of all, a caveat, I'm going to break this down for you in the way it works for me. It might not work that way for you. Unfortunately, creative process is a matter of trial and error, sometimes trial and error from book to book, not even just person to person. But I'm kind of hoping that this little lecture will be like a self-help book. The thing about most self-help books, self-help books is they don't serve you entirely. If there are 10 chapters in a self-help book, maybe five sentences in chapter four speak to you. Maybe there are things you have to throw away along the way because they don't speak to you. So if you come through this little workshop and you have just a slightly better understanding of your story and how maybe to get from the beginning to the end, how to get through the story corpse process, then I will consider that a success. And I hope that you will too. This is designed to help you get through some of those hurdles of drafting, the fear, the perfectionism, whatever it is that's holding you back. And like I say, if that if that's what happens, then I'll consider it a success. But that feels like the necessary caveat is I'm going to be telling you based on what works for me in the hopes that some of it works for you. Caveat number two, if you are a pantser by trade, meaning you are somebody who flies through a draft by the seat of your pants, discovery is the only thing that keeps you going, this class might make your skin crawl a little bit, but again, stick with me. You might connect with more of it than you think. So with that in mind, what is a story corpse? It is the idea of a body as a book. We're going to start with the bones. Then we're going to look at muscle and tissue. Then we're going to look at flesh. And eventually we're going to look at makeup. So those are kind of the four pillars that we're going to start with. Because if we build a story from the inside out instead of the outside in, the idea is that it will be solid, it will be sound, and the work that we have to do later will be additive to the work that we've already done instead of negating it. So, number one, bones. What do I mean when I say bones? I mean the plot, a, literally the story skeleton, which is a phrase that fits perfectly into this extended metaphor. I start my story with the bones. 
when I'm brainstorming, I might have aesthetics in mind, but for me, having good bones, good story bones, is the key to getting through the creative process intact. I'm somebody who's extremely prone to self-doubt and to the desire to quit. And I find that having bones that I can build on will keep me from quitting, from feeling lost, whatever it is. So what do I mean in this case by bones? I mean story beats. Sometimes they're big moments, sometimes they're small moments, just like a body has big bones and small bones, but they are all essential in making the story. You don't have to have them in order. You just have to have your raw ingredients, your elements. I'm gonna try very hard not to mix metaphors here and go into a kitchen metaphor. We're gonna stay with the body metaphor. So I mean the raw ingredients. Imagine you have a bag of bones, you want to have the material to dump it out on your table and begin to assemble your story. You might have 20, you might have 200. You just need to make sure that you have enough pieces to make a body. And that might be daunting to a lot of you, this idea that you need to go in knowing. But this is less about going in knowing, and this is about going in and brainstorming, going in and discovering, going in and excavating, and unearthing those ideas. And maybe you will miss a knuckle or a tooth or a scapula. You don't actually need to have all of the bones, but you need to have enough of the bones that you can create a story scaffold, a story skeleton. So for me, I like my story skeleton bones to be scenes. That means I have a lot of bones, probably closer to 100 than to 10. But I want each and every one of those scenes to be a beat, to be a moment that I want to flesh out over the course of the narrative. Ones that I advise you to have are the beginning and the end. Everything else in between, you can kind of Decide which moments are going to serve you. Decide which elements are going to serve you best. But I'm going to argue for having the beginning and the end. The heads and the feet. Hopefully only one head. The head and the feet. <laughs> I would advise having five to ten moments that you feel are essential to making your story your story. Five to ten moments that this story, as you conceive of it, does not exist without. Maybe this is the climax of the narrative. Maybe it's a battle scene. Maybe it's a murder. Maybe it's a kissing scene. Maybe it's the moment when two of the main characters meet for the very first time. Maybe it's a betrayal. You're not going to have all of the bones and you're not going to be able to find all of the bones before you actually start the rest of this process. The goal is how much of it can you create, even if some of it is a placeholder, even if it's a, I know I want something like X, Y, Z to happen here. Because what you're doing is you're still creating the space that you need. You're still creating the structure that you need to build on. Those details will change. Details will change over the course of the creative process. There is not an outliner in this world who gets through the process without details changing. It is not about knowing everything. It is just about knowing enough. So I want you to think of your story in terms of the skeleton, what needs to happen. And then try and create a line, right? You have the beginning. I really want you to think of your beginning. And you have the end. I am that person who swears by an ending. This is because on bad days, it will keep you from quitting. On good days, it will give you something to work toward. But the ending and the beginning are so essential in terms of deciding the tone, the purpose, the arc, the desire, the fulfillment, all of these things about your story can be really decoded and anchored in the beginning and the end. So, and then I want you to think of at least 10 moments that happen between them. And this is not something you're supposed to do right now. This will take time. This is, this is an excavation, remember? But as you do that, and you're like, how am I gonna get from 10 to 100? Well, the way you do this is you create a timeline, right? You create a story timeline, if you will, which is not the same as a chronological timeline, but looking kind of at your story, your chapters, and then you start to look at the space between the points and you start to ask yourself, okay, here's my beginning and here's the thing I know I'd like to have happen, I think, next. What happens between those two points? And you start to do that for all of your points. You begin to close the distance and you just start to play 
a game, if you will, with your story. You start to ask yourself a choose your own adventure. What's the most exciting way to get from this point to this point? What's everything that could happen between this point and this point? This process is going to change a lot for each of you, but the goal is by the end of it that you will have a story skeleton. Sometimes people will call this a zero draft. For some, it's 5,000 words long. For some, it's 10,000 words long. I've written a story skeleton that was 15,000 words long, but that's because for me, a story skeleton is every single scene or chapter that I know of. Not to say every single scene and chapter that will be in the book, but every one that I can wrap my head around before I start working. And this is, a, this is not a small task. And I know this sounds like it might be taking the creative joy out of the process. I don't want you to think of it like that. This is a way to stress check your story, to make sure you have enough meat, even though we haven't gotten to the meat yet, to make sure you have enough material there to play with, right? To make sure you have enough space to grow your characters, to grow your narrative, to grow your plot. But this is really... The bones, I want you to think of them as plot. There are character elements here. There are stylistic elements here. But what we're really looking for is story. Do we have enough story to build a skeleton? Do we have enough places for things to go wrong, for things to go right, for those failures and successes of our characters and their journeys? And the goal is by the end that you'll have quite a few bones. And you have to try and put them in some order. Even if you're writing an alinear story or a story where those things aren't going to happen in order, just create this skeleton based on the potential of how it could be, right? I look at a book like The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which has two timelines, the present and then 300 years in the past. I didn't know where every single one of those past tense scenes was going to go, but I just made space for them along the way. I just made sure that I built them into my plan. So the goal is that you're going to think of all of these pieces. And it's not a matter of knowing everything. It's a matter of making sure that you have enough and that what you do have excites you. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that every one of those bones can be summed up in a paragraph, right? These are beats. These are small kind of codified portions of the story. So for me, for a book like A Darker Shade of Magic, it was probably a hundred bones, a hundred scenes that I just started working with, putting in order so that I had something about five to 10,000 words long that was a, just a sequence of paragraphs. Each one was going to become an entire chapter or an entire scene, but I had bulk. I said, okay, now I have enough to work with. Now I have my story bones. Usually each one of those bones is three to four sentences, maybe eight sentences at the most. I'm just trying to distill down what I want to accomplish in each scene, like um, Gathering of Shadows. And you don't have to know anything about my books for this to make sense. A Gathering of Shadows opens with a main character sitting in a boat tied up in the middle of the sea. And she climbs onto a new boat and we discover that she is playing a trick on the boat, right? So she gets rescued and it turns out that this was all a plan. This sequence, which would go on to take up 5,000 words at the beginning of the book, this kind of episodic arc, was maybe five sentences in the beginning. That was just a beat. I knew I wanted to open with Lila Bard. I knew I wanted her to, you know, pull off a heist, basically. So you do not have to be specific. You can be as specific as you want or as general as you want. Again, we are almost tracing out the space here. So those are the bones. Let's say that you end up with 50 of them. Most books have like 50 chapters, something like that. So we'll look at each chapter that way. And then you put them all in order and you're like, this is so much work. When do I get to write? Well, I would argue, first of all, that that was writing. Brainstorming is writing. Deleting is writing. Rewriting is writing. Daydreaming is writing. It's all writing. Deleting is certainly writing. But now you've done the first key part. And maybe you're not coming to this with a blank piece of paper. Maybe you already have your skeleton, this is just a good thing to check it against. Maybe you've been brainstorming a story. Maybe you're doing NaNoWriMo. This is a really good way to say, do I have enough story to be working with? So let's say you do. Let's say you feel ready. Now it's time to write the first draft. This brings me to muscle and tissue. You have a skeleton, got a lot of pieces. You're like Victoria and now have a hundred note cards or just a hundred or, or 50 random paragraphs. What do I do now? 
So now you get to build a body. Congratulations. This can be done in order. This can be done out of order. You can pick the limbs that excite you and go for, or go from the beginning to the end. Often I do a bit of both. I might pick the five beats that excite me most that I feel are gonna be the major bones in my body. This is gonna be a very extended metaphor, just so you know. And I'll write those, but sometimes I try and write in order. And the thing that you have to understand is you've done all this work, you've made a skeleton, you've made sure you have these beats. Now the body is going to grow in interesting and unpredictable ways, and that's good. That's where the surprises come in. I mean, think about all the different shapes that a body takes set over the same bones. We all have roughly the same number of skeletal pieces, and yet we all take a variety of shapes, and your story is going to do the same thing. So drafting is where we get to do this. Now, from a technical perspective, what I do personally to turn a skeleton in a story, let's say that I have, I use Scrivener which just allows me to not crash word because I like to have everything in its own document. So let's say I have a hundred bones and each bone is a small paragraph. I then put each one of those small paragraphs at the top of their own document. I then write my entire scene inspired by that little paragraph at the top. And then I slot the scene or chapter back in where the paragraph was. So I'm literally growing a body around these bones. I had these narrow little pieces and out of them have grown something much more substantial. So really think of those bones in that way as a prompt. You have just designed yourself 50 to 100 short story prompts in which every short story in this case is a scene or chapter or beat of your book. And this allows the, the story to grow in organic ways. This is future Victoria chiming in with a few notes because as I was going through and editing this, I was like, wait, I have something to add here. And then I was like, oh yeah, I'm filming this video. I can just add a note. I just want to say that thinking about individual chapters of a story as short stories in and of themselves or as episodes in and of themselves is a really helpful way to think of stories sometimes because I certainly know that I get daunted by the prospect of writing an entire book. It's one of the reasons I build this skeleton. But additionally, Every scene or chapter should accomplish something. Really, every scene or chapter is following its own little mini arc with its own mini promise and resolution, promise and fulfillment. And so I think it can be a really interesting way if you struggle with the grandeur and scale of a novel to stop and think about things in small bite-sized pieces, remembering that each, and each one of those little bites needs to accomplish some kind of beginning, middle, and end unto itself. But the thing I want you to remember is that this is where the big plot work happens. This is where your characters take on life. This is where twists and turns, the pieces you couldn't predict in that story skeleton, surprise you. This is where things go off book, but we're keeping that skeleton in mind. And this is why some of those smaller bones, those missing pieces or the pieces we're not sure of, don't matter as much because as we actually write the story, we're gonna get surprised. No matter how much planning you do, there will always be surprises and that's good. And the muscle and tissue, the growing of the actual body is where we want those surprises to happen. Early enough on in the process that we can adjust and adapt and check in with our skeleton and say, how does this change? Does it change what I had planned and in what ways? It is not a bad thing to be surprised in this way by your story. We've built the space into the process so that we can be surprised. Um, if some of your big moments begin to veer drastically from the skeleton, then this is a good time to stop and check with that skeleton and ask yourself, do you want to veer in this way? Or do you want to find your way back to your skeleton? What's causing you to divert? This is really a way in a lot of ways for you to just stay in continuous communication with your own story. So just checks and balances yourself and say, okay, actually I like what I'm doing here a lot better than what I planned. So how can I adapt my skeleton to reflect that, right? How am I surprising myself? That's the beautiful part of the creative process. There's something else that I want to point out here, which is that if you're, if you're like me and you focus on pretty lines, even at this stage, you want the writing to be pretty, that's not bad. Well, maybe it's bad, but it's the kind of bad that I experience too. I'm the kind of writer who tries to make every single layer of the process pretty, despite the fact I know it will make it harder to let go of lines later. I can't help myself. I'm the kind of writer who, if I'm not excited by the words that I have down on paper, I can't seem to keep going. I lose interest or I lose heart. So you just have to know that you might have to lose words at this point. You might not get to keep the exact prose. So try not to get bogged down 
by picking the perfect adjective or verb, but also something that might help you is create a cut file. Whether it's a Word document or a Scrivener, subfile or whatever it is, create a cut file so that as you lose pieces later on in the process or even at this stage, at any stage, instead of deleting, we're putting them in the cut file in the hopes that it eases our pain of having to delete these words. And you can tell yourself you might come back to those words. Nine times out of 10, you probably won't, but they still exist. So if that helps you prune a little bit easier, then I highly recommend creating a cut file. So the bones are the plot and the muscle and tissue are the actual draft, the story that's happening. And I know that I've said not to get too bogged down into the aesthetics at this point, but there are two major exceptions to that, voice and tense. Voice and tense are inextricable from the actual drafting of your story. This isn't about picking pretty words, this is about picking how you're telling your story. Are you telling it in first person present tense? Are you telling it in third person past? Are you telling it in second person or third person present? These choices, the voice of the story, you have to make early enough on so that you can execute the story. So those are really the two aesthetic decisions that should be made at this point, voice and tense. Not to say that sometimes they change. I mean, I have had tense change in a revision. I've had voice change, but you should really keep an eye to that even at this early stage, because whether you have an actual narrator or not, voice and tense, the way you choose to convey this story is doing a huge amount of work, as much work as the story itself. So we do have to pay attention to those. So over the course of this, however you're going to do it, the muscle and tissue become your proper first draft. You can do it, as I said, in order. You can do it out of order. You can do it a bit of both. You can explore. You can go back to your skeleton and adjust whatever you want to do. This is the transmutation from a skeleton to a body, the very first parts of the body. Now, it doesn't have flesh on it yet. We're going to get there. But like it has quite a bit of bulk. This is how we get to our first draft, the expansion from ideas into something actual. And once we have the muscle and tissue, now we have something to work with. Now we have a combination of our ideas and our execution. So this brings us to flesh. As many of you know, a first draft is only a beginning. It's a first incarnation, but we've probably learned things along the way at this point. Maybe we've changed pieces of our skeleton. We've got a lot of good meat on our bones, but it's not a human yet. I wouldn't call it a person. Revision or flesh is the process of making that happen. Some writers will revise once or twice. Others will revise a dozen times. Some will try to accomplish everything in one go and others will go piece by piece. For me, I usually revise in three to four rounds. First comes the big picture, continuity, story work, world building, rule building, then the internal work of character, making sure the person on the page matches the one in my head, their motives, their nuances, their emotional arcs, etc., etc. It's me, future Victoria again, back to add something about character because I wanted to add uh, just a few tips for when you're stress checking your own characters. One of the reasons that I like to have the ending as one of my first points that I figure out is because I like to figure out who my characters are going to be at the very end of the story in order to figure out who they are at the beginning. Essentially, I meet them at the end and then I rewind them along the way. Figuring out who your characters want to be when you leave them can help you figure out who they should be when you first meet them. In addition to that, I like to try and assign a character a mantra or motto. And I do this by figuring out the three pillars of my character, what they fear, what they want, and what they're willing to do to get it. And from there, I can build that motto or that mantra from them. And I can say, hey, like for Delilah Bard, if a thing is worth having, it is worth taking. Right. And then over the course of the story, you can not only see them live up to those mottos and follow those mottos, but you can start to ask, what would it take for this character to break this motto? So those are just little things to think about when it comes to stress checking your characters, checking them against their future self from the end of the story all the way back to the beginning of the story. These tend to take multiple rounds, but for the purposes of our analogy today, I'm going to group all of these things together into the category of flesh, all of the revision is the category of flesh. Maybe not that last revision, that polish, but all of the, oh crap, I made a thing, how do I make it better? That is the process of adding flesh. Flesh is where we take a hard look at the body that we're creating. We smooth out its shape, 
we check in with the story we wanted to tell and compare it to what's in front of us and we decide what we're presenting to the world. Okay, because I think what I'm getting at here again and again is that it's really important to check in with what excited us in the beginning. Why did we want to tell the story in the first place? What were we hoping to tell? And how has that changed along the way? Because it does change. In the act of creating our body, we will gain new ideas. We will let go of old ideas. And sometimes where we get stuck is between the thing we originally wanted to create and the thing we are creating now. And the thing we are creating now is not necessarily worse or better, but it is always different. And it's important that we check in with ourselves on, did we stray too far? Have we strayed in a more exciting direction? So revision is one of the places, kind of the most important place where we check in and we ask ourselves what we're doing. <laughs> or if you're me, you're like, what am I doing? But yes, in some version or another, your needs in the flesh portion will depend heavily on how messy your corpse is at this point. If you are someone who revises and polishes as you draft, this might be where you look with a keener eye to continuity. If you don't revise at all as you draft, this is where you're gonna have to look at everything. And that's why if you don't revise at all when you draft, flesh is probably a few rounds, right? We are, we are tackling things one thing at a time because it can get overwhelming. But this is somewhere where we begin to fine tune and finesse our twists and turns, our characters, where they started, where they ended, the relationships, the tension, where the middle is sagging because the middle always sags. That is what the middle does. It is just a natural effect of creating a body. And if all of this sounds really broad and vague, it's unfortunately because this is perhaps the most personal and diverse element of the process. My personal relationship to flesh, as I said, is that I go through multiple rounds of revision. I have had to rewrite books multiple times and I've had to do minor polishes to books multiple times and basically everything along the way. So one of the reasons I'm being vague is because the needs of revision will depend on what your relationship to the drafting process is. Most of us prefer one or the other. If you're like me, you prefer neither and you just enjoy having written when it's done. But flesh is where you're going to really start to fine tune the body. And then after you've done that, what's left is makeup. Now, I say makeup, substitute clothes, coverings of any kind, anything you like, but what I'm talking about here is the pros the word choices, the quality of the lines. If bones are plot, muscle is structure, story is flesh, this is prose, okay? This is the part where we get to choose and refine and detail. And as I've said before, it's really tempting to make every line beautiful along the way, I know. But the more time you spend on beautifying early on, the more you risk losing those beautiful work. And like I said, I do this. I can't move forward unless I love what I have in some way. But the first time I had to scrap a chapter or an entire novel, um, <laughs> the fact I was really attached to the words that I had to delete really made it infinitely harder. And remember that cut file I was talking about. That is going to be your friend. If you write a beautiful sentence and then that scene no longer serves you as you're working through revisions, put it in the cut file and maybe it will find its way back to you. Or maybe you will say, I really need a great adjective. I'm gonna go look for something that I cut or a beautiful turn of phrase that didn't make it in. So what, I'm, so what I propose doing if you're that kind of person is to find a balance. Make it lovely if you need to along the way, but don't spend hours looking for a word choice. This is where you get to do that. The makeup is kind of your reward. This is the place where you get to sit with those word choices and say, what is the exact way that I want to say that? And I, if you can, I highly recommend saving that for the final passes of the story, just to protect yourself from the heartbreak of having to scrap a thing. Or, or conversely, I think sometimes we wanna hold on to scenes for the wrong reasons. We wanna hold on to things because they're beautiful and not because they serve us. And so I certainly have found more than once that I've been loath to let go of a scene because the writing in that scene made me happy, not because it was doing the story work. But now, assume you get to this point, you have reached makeup, congratulations. This is the time for beautifying. This is the time where you look at voice and cadence and rhythm. And we assume that it's, it's just creating finesse, but it's really not because these elements are what will shape the reader's experience. How something is written entices us just as much as what's being said. It's just the way it is. I know aesthetics shouldn't matter as much as substance, but they do. Think of what makeup does. 
Think of what clothes do. They convey a style. And this is your opportunity to really sit with the exact details and the nuances that you want to create. So you had a story idea. From that idea, you created bones with which to work. From those bones, you grew muscle and tissue and built an entire first draft. From that first draft, you added flesh and polish, smoothed out those features, refined it into an individual. And from there, you got to decorate it. That is how you create a story corpse. Now, of course, the hard work is what you do along the way in every one of those scenes, but hopefully this helps you think about the process of story making in a admittedly morbid, but hopefully organic way. Hi there. <laughs> now this is live me. Think of me as the person that existed beyond the future Victoria that came to talk to you in the middle of that video. Um, I have been pulling up questions as you've been sending them in. I know we don't have very much time, but I am gonna dive right in and try and answer some of these wonderful, wonderful questions. And also thank you for bearing with me for this very extended, very morbid metaphor. Um, Sylvia and Hannah, you have asked a similar question. Hannah, you asked, how do you know if you have enough to work with? And Sylvia, how do you know if a story is meant to be a whole novel or better as a short story? And I think that these questions go hand in hand. They're kind of the same question in a way, which is you're asking, how do you know you have enough? And that's one of the reasons that we do the skeleton is because if you end up with only a handful of skeleton pieces, only a handful of bones, um, you probably don't have a novel. If you end up with a handful of bones and it feels like it's conveying everything you want it to convey, that's a short story. If you end up with hundreds of bones in your skeleton, you definitely have enough material for a novel. But one of the reasons that we build the skeleton first is just for that reason, is to make sure that we have enough plot, to make sure that we have enough story, we have enough conflict and character, all of these key pieces that we're building on so that we don't run out of steam 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 pages in. So that's kind of the essential reason for really making sure that we have those little bones and those big bones and seeing how much we have to work with. So um, Christina asks, what do you recommend if we have a near complete skeleton, but for that one bone that's clearly missing and we can't for the life of us dig it out into daylight? I love how you all are extending this metaphor with me. So can I just say thank you for that? I think... If you find yourself missing a small beat, a small bone, a small moment, you have to stop and ask yourself, what was it supposed to be doing? Because maybe you don't need it. Maybe whatever it was supposed to be doing can be assumed into a different scene, into a different, into a different moment, into a different character. So it's not like keeping beats for the sake of keeping beats. Every beat, every bone should be doing something, should be doing the work. And, and so if it's not, then you don't need it. Maybe you didn't need that bone at all. Or maybe, as I say, you can just achieve what you're trying to achieve in one of the bones that you already have. Amy asks, I know in this process, it's better to start with a plot idea. It's not, it's just one way of doing things, but I'm the kind of person who usually starts with characters. If this happens to you, what do you do to find the plot? Okay, so I think it's really important to remember that characters are the heart of a novel because plot is great, plot is momentous, but if we don't care about the people that the story is happening to, we will not care for very long about the story. So character is absolutely essential, but with character comes conflict and conflict is part of plot. So if you're looking at your characters, what the, one of the first things you can start to do is ask, okay, what do they want? What are they afraid of? What are they willing to do to get what they want? What kind of situations can I put them in that try them and test them and put them at odds with their goals? And all of a sudden you start asking yourself, how do I make my characters uncomfortable? How do I you know, put them at the bottom of the hill that they need to climb? So you start to engage with plot as conflict as it relates to your characters, because we're not playing The Sims, right? We're not just building a world and then just like letting our people loose in it. That would be fun, but that's not how we get a story. We need conflict. We need that dynamism. And so create your characters if that's where you start, but then create the characters who are the foils 
for your characters, meaning the characters who are at odds with your characters, and then start looking at, okay, well, where can those paths cross? Okay, hold on, I have to, I have to reopen my question file. Okay. <laughs> Holly says, what do you find the easiest part of writing and what do you find the most difficult? I am somebody who loves having written and finds the act of writing difficult. And a, a metaphor that I mentioned at the beginning is the glass orb metaphor, the idea that an idea, when you haven't written it yet, is beautiful and perfect. It's just flawless. And then the act of writing it down is smashing that beautiful orb against a wall. I am somebody who constantly has to confront the imperfection of writing a first draft. So for me, interestingly, building the skeleton is the fun part because I haven't actually created it. I've pre-created it. I am pre-writing. I'm envisioning and brainstorming and I haven't done anything wrong. And I'm really playing a choose your own adventure with the minor bones in my book. I'm finding the most interesting way through the skeleton. So I love doing that. And I love the final polish of makeup or clothes or whatever you want to call it. Like I love the point where I get to choose between two words, where I get to say, does the cadence of that line do exactly what I want it to do. Everything in between, miserable for me. I like love that there are people out there who love the act of writing. I love the act of having written and I love the idea of coming up with stories, but I am constantly getting in my own way. It's one of the reasons that I started using this skeleton metaphor was to try and give myself enough material that I didn't spend my entire time wondering, do I have enough story for a book? Do I have enough conflict? Is it big enough? Is it bold enough? I find that everything I do is in the interest of keeping myself from quitting. Okay. Lisa asks, what do you do when you get stuck in the flabby middle of the book? I choose to pretend at that point that there is no middle. Like, why do we have to think of the book as a beginning and a middle and an end? Because each section Maybe we look at them as acts instead. Act one, act two, act three. Some plays have five acts. It doesn't matter. Each section is like an episode, an arc. It's each section's trying to accomplish something. So I choose to deny the existence of the middle because middles are terrifying and they tend to feel flabby because we don't have the newness of the first act where we're introducing everything and we don't have the satisfaction of the last act where we're resolving everything. All we have is the suspension. And so I find in that middle to try and search for smaller episodes inside of it where we can have smaller moments of ascent and descent, of accomplishment, of feeling like there's a mini, you know, rise and fall to try and deny that that middle even exists. So don't even think about your book as having a middle. Think of your book as having 10 tiny arcs and one big one. Okay, let's see. <laughs> Tara asks, or Tara, I'm sorry, uh, how do you know if your draft needs a full rewrite? Well, I have rewritten two books in my entire career, The Near Witch and Vengeful. I have written, rewritten many pieces of other books. And it usually, um, I usually know sometimes I don't know. Sometimes my editor is like, hey, your book is fine. And like fine or good enough or perfectly satisfactory is not a thing I want to hear. I want my book to be the best it can be. So sometimes it's having a voice that says to you, I believe that you are capable of doing something more. But sometimes I know because, oh my God, I can't believe I'm going to use another story metaphor. I cultivate something in my bones called a story monster which is essentially, I read a ton. I watch a lot of television and movies. I listen to music. I consume stories in every format possible. And the more stories you consume, the more you train this intuitive sense of when something is working and when something is not. And the more you write, the more you learn to listen to that gut sense, that story monster behind your ribs that says, something's something's bumping, something doesn't feel right here. And we can choose to ignore that story monster, but over time you will really discover that most of the time it's right. Most of the time we don't wanna to listen to it because it's hard and because it makes everything harder because rewriting is not as fun as just having written it right the first time. But the truth is we can't write it right the first time. And I think you really have to want to get better. You can't, you can have the like the moment of, oh God, this is too much work, I'm scared. But at the end of the day, if you don't wanna make the best story you can, 
it's going to be too tempting to become complacent with a story that's, quote, good enough. Okay, I'm running out of time. I'm trying to pick the last question. <sighs> okay, Rebecca asked, does the story skeleton stay in its own document or do you build onto it as you draft? Both. So the story skeleton has its own document and then I take those little paragraphs, the individual bones, I copy them, I pull them into a blank document, I put them at the very top of the page and then I build from there. So the story skeleton exists unmarred, perfect, preserved, and then in another document, I'm expanding on it. I like to keep all of my versions separate. So story skeleton stays its own thing, first draft stays its own thing, second, third, fourth draft, they all have their own documents. Even if I'm cutting and pasting pieces, I just like the, the freshness of a blank page. Let's see if I have time for one more question. I don't know if I do. Oh my God, so much pressure. Um, Diane asks, how often do your essential moments change in a plot? For me, not terribly often because of how much time I spend with that skeleton, but smaller moments do change. And sometimes I realize that smaller moments could have been a bigger moment. I'm constantly looking for how to compile, strengthen. Sometimes my big moment is a placeholder for another big moment. So you're kind of constantly checking in with yourself and making sure that you are staying on track with the kind of story that you want, that it's as big as you want it to be. But remember, because this is the last thing I'll have time to say, you don't have to do it all the first time. You can't. Your job for the first draft is to put something on paper. Your job for every draft after that is to make it better. I've so enjoyed talking with you all. I've so enjoyed your questions. I hope that this has been helpful and not just all over the place, but if it's been all over the place, that's the way my brain works too. Maybe it's the way that your brain works. Regardless, I just, I have had so much fun trying to extend one of my random metaphors into something that somebody else might actually find insight from. So thank you. That's all.